Where is it? It's from Delhi? Yeah. You ordered it through the internet? Yes. No. I ordered it through the mail. I don't fucking know what you do. You could have gone to Delhi to get it. For all I fucking know, use any excuse to uh, get on a plane. What's that, Oscar? Sure. Uh, I need to uh, restring it and then get the, the pickups working and then get the amplifier on and we are gonna make some rock music with this thing. It's gonna be fantastic. It sounded like you were playing the beginning of a Drake Nicki Minaj song. You accidentally played the beginning of a Drake Nicki Minaj song, which I, I vaguely understand that now. those are both people who live on this planet, and I yeah, think that they're, they're probably very famous. Good. Yeah. Live from West Berlin, it's the committee program brought to you by Cadre Cigarettes. Starring Ron Chattery, Julia Doubleday, Forrest Lovett, Fiamma Meli, Jevat Castrati, and yours truly, Jacopo Castelletti. We now join the show already in progress. Hi, and welcome back to the committee program. I am your host, Ron Chaudhary, and this is another of our alternate week study content episodes. Every other episode, we have a listening section, a watching section, something where we take a primary piece of material and uh, actually watch it together and discuss it. Uh, but actually, there is so much going on in the world and we have been so dominated on the show by the war in Ukraine and by the elections in France that the show's own Forrest Levette wanted to do a global news rodeo centering on things going on in some other spots. And so we are gonna do that first. And here is your global news rodeo. This is the global news rodeo with Ron Chattery and Forrest Levette. Hi, and welcome to your Global News Rodeo, a roundup of world events as curated by the show's own Forrest Levette. Let's go. <laughs> Item one, Viva la Presidente. Recall keeps Mexican president in power. Jacobin is reporting President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, or AMLO, has won Mexico's recall election vote. In the first election recall in Mexican history, Lopez Obrador garnered over 15 million votes, which was over 93% in favor of him remaining in office. The surprisingly strong support was more than the official vote total in the 2018 election. AMLO and his party, Morena, opened the door for direct democracy when they proposed a referendum in the last presidential campaign. With the decision, AMLO will be allowed to complete his six-year turn until 2024. Although, for the referendum to remain binding, the turnout threshold must be at least 40%, given the actual turnout of just 17%, critics say the law is at risk of being a dead letter, which prevents dramatic democracy but lacks any legitimate legal authority. Furthermore, any attempts at electoral reform will be challenged by the country's conservative National Electoral Institute, or the INE. Uh, look, I mean, good news so far as it goes, but we need to keep pushing. It's not enough to elect people who represent you. These days, you also have to do a lot to keep them there. Uh, and that's going to smoothly take us into <laughs> item two, pack your bags. Connor moved his Pakistan PM. Uh, look, I think for us, the pun relies on me saying Pakistan and not Pakistan. And I'm not trying to be like somebody who aggressively says pronunciations of things correctly, but I don't want to start off on the wrong foot with a pun like that. That's kind of, that's kind of where I'm coming down on that. Okay. Uh, Democracy Now! is reporting that Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, has been ousted in a no-confidence vote on Monday. The Pakistani parliament voted to remove Khan and replace him with opposition leader Shabazz Sharif, who editorial, I will say, is a charming character who is always under clouds investigation along with uh, folks in his family, and, and they are a huge mess. Uh, the decision came last month after Khan attempted to dissolve the parliament, which the nation's Supreme Court ruled to be illegal. Khan lashed out afterwards, blaming the removal on a plot of U.S.-backed regime change. Uh, Tub Saeed, a member of the left-wing uh, Amwai Workers' Party, provided some perspective of past removals of PM, saying it's usually been done by the military intervention, so it's a good step forward in terms of democracy in Pakistan that this was not done through a military dictatorship or military intervention, but done through a vote of no confidence which went through the parliament or the National Assembly 
itself. I will say, and I don't follow uh, Pakistani politics like I should, but I am around some, you know, smart, engaged folks who do. And I know uh, that a lot of people feel like even if this wasn't directly done by the military, that it was done at the behest and uh, of that certainly that segment of political pressure in Pakistani society and that people do feel very strongly that there is um, at least a, if not a direct and overt push by the U.S., certainly people who they have been helping throughout the years are folks pushing for this change. And so I think you're going to see, you know, who is a fairly popular prime minister coming up against forces that normally were able to kind of enforce these kind of regime chains. I mean, think of a place like Bolivia. I don't think people can make these kinds of things stick anymore. You know, we saw in Kosovo, Albin Kurti, who was removed by Trump in many ways. We saw him uh, come back much stronger in the next election. We saw in Bolivia a kind of coup get uncooed. Um, the hedge, the, the, the kind of the power structure of the world is more multipolar all the time. And I think whether you are Russia, whether you are America, whether you are any of folks who are used to that bipolar uh, world, you need to get used to the fact that it is harder for you to project power than it used to be. That's what I want to say. I got a long way to say that, but that's what I wanted to say. Item three, like Muppet Babies, but with more executions. Another Marcos in the Philippines. And I do have to say that I actually wrote that headline and I'm very proud of it. And it's important to me to let you know that I wrote it and Forrest didn't because I am a small, petty man, a small, petty man. NPR is reporting the son of late and longtime Filipino dictator Ferdinand Marcos is now running for president. 64 years old, Ferdinand Bong Bong Marcos Jr. is showing a slight lead in the polls for next month's election. The emergence of yet another Marcos to the national spotlight is polarizing, energizing supporters of his father while causing opponents to worry about the nation's fragile democracy. Adding fuel to the familiar fire, the daughter of outgoing president Rodrigo Duterte, Sarah Duterte, is running for vice president. Right? It's getting, it's getting good, folks. If elected, Marcus Jr. will attempt to restore the legacy of the family name. And under his father's 21-year rule, the country was placed under martial law for almost a decade. That regime was blamed for 74,000 warrantless civilian arrests and over 4,000 deaths, along with suppression of free speech and the persecution of political opponents. Uh, and, you know, we can't say enough what happens in the Philippines is America's problem forever because we messed that place up good and forever, even at the same time as pretending that we had no imperial ambitions. The Filipino war is something, you know what, I, we should actually do a whole thing on this. We should get somebody on and we should really talk about this. It is one of the most sinful chapters in American history and it's something that we learn very, very little about. And actually the kind of where it intersects with arms and armament and, uh, and manufacturing of weapons is extremely interesting. We will do this, we will do this. For a committee afternoon. Hi, and welcome back to the committee program. I am your host, Arun Chaudhary, and tonight we are going to listen to and watch another piece of wartime propaganda 
This time it is Listen to Britain by Humphrey Jennings, which was released in 1943. So that's during the Blitz, you know, uh, you know, when World War II was probably the hardest on the city of London uh, specifically and southern England generally. And this film is very different than a lot of what we've watched, which in one case uh, is certainly in the um, Frank Capra film we watched is, you know, very rock'em, sock'em, planes, dogfighting, all of this. We can do it, patriotism. Then we watched the piece that I had made at the end of the Iraq War, which was very competence and explanations. Uh, then we certainly watched the very defensive film about Japanese internment camps. This is actually a piece of poetry by a guy who knows how to do that. Humphrey Jennings had, at this point in his career, made several very interesting documentaries detailing the work and home life of working class people all across the UK and producing some very interesting films. And he was someone who thought that the British public would not sort of want to absorb that same hyper adrenaline propaganda that the Americans made and so set out to make the kind of film he did make which would be quiet observational um, looks at things and so this film has no real narration other than the beginning it is just a series of verite scenes going from factories to fields to farms etc and uh, very famously there is a concert of German music that's held you know during the blitz to show how the British people are above all of these kind of uh, hatreds and certainly are, are happy to celebrate German music even while they're locked in a deadly struggle with them. Uh, you know, whether or not this really speaks to the, the British character is certainly debatable, but whether or not it makes an interesting film is not. This is a highly observational, incredibly poetic, and just much different take on what wartime propaganda can be. So let's take a look, let's take a listen, and I will see you on the other side. Canadian. I have been listening to Britain. I have heard the sound of her life by day and by night. Many years ago, a great American speaking of Britain said that in the storm of battle and conflict, she had a secret vigor and a pulse like a cannon. In the great sound picture that is here presented, you too will hear that heart beating. For blended together in one great symphony is the music of Britain at war. The evening hymn of the lark, the roar of spitfires, the dancers in the great ballroom at Blackpool, the clank of machinery and shunting trains, soldiers of Canada holding in memory, in proud memory, their home on the range. The BBC sending truth on its journey around the world. The trumpet call of freedom, the war song of a great people, the first sure notes of the march of victory, as you and I listen to Britain.
This is London Calling. London Calling at the beginning of tonight's broadcasting in the African service. London is calling you in the 1945 land or in the air, and in the Merchant Navy.
right, press, left, press again, right and press, look well up, lift your chest when you press there, now turn, press again, and a twist and a press, swing, press, and stop, drop your arms and look to the ground.
Okay, so that is 1943's Listen to Britain by Humphrey Jennings. Uh, and it's quite good and quite different, right? Like we said, it's these observational slices of life put in with only the diegetic sound uh, made to connect with us in an emotional way, right? We've talked often on the show about how sound and the kind of real sound and authentic sound is the actual way that we perceive things emotionally, being animals who can listen much better than we can see. Uh, I also want to say people in the Ministry of Information were extremely concerned about this film. They did not like it. They thought that it was sort of weak and all the things that you can think that somebody who's looking for more hard-nosed propaganda would think about this film. Um, and were surprised when it was incredibly warmly received all over the country, and especially when they showed it to audiences in factories and in community centers and in these kind of situations where people were living this home front experience, they very openly wept and embraced the kind of idea of this film. And so Humphrey Jennings' supposition that this different kind of film would have a different kind of effect was definitely played out. But even then, the Ministry of Information didn't want to release this to a foreign audience without putting that weird uh, beginning narration where it kind of explains what they're doing. Uh, and this was deemed necessary because otherwise, you know, you can look at some of the notes people wrote about it, but they said this would be a disaster if we were to show this to the, our American allies. This would be a disaster if we were to show it in Canada. This would be a disaster uh, because people would be like, what is Britain doing? What is the ambivalence about the war here? There's not a clear good guy, bad guy. There's just sort of this emotional feeling. But that's not what Humphrey Jennings is trying to do here. He's not trying to explain Right? He's trying to make you feel what people are feeling in this moment, and that creates a feeling of solidarity. He's not trying to explain how we got here. He's not trying to explain how they're going to win the war. He's not try even trying to explain what comes next, because that doesn't matter to the mission of this film. And I think that's what a lot of people who are worried about it missed the point of, right? Not everything has to do everything. Everything has to have a specific mission. These things are little machines that are designed to do something. And also that you start by thinking. You start by having an idea. Right? You could imagine if you already know what a propaganda World War II film is, you've made five or six of these that you would immediately just jump in and start cutting it up and getting all the thing. This is an idea-driven film. And I love it. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much for tuning into the committee program. We know you have many options when it comes to content consumption, and we appreciate your attention to this new season with new episodes on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and at 10 p.m. Central European Time. You can support the show by becoming a member on patreon.com slash the committee program. You can follow committee on Twitter, uh, backslash committee pro, on YouTube, the committee program, on Instagram, the committee program, on Facebook, the committee program, and you can visit the committee program company store at tpublic.com, the committee program shop. Special thanks, as always, to our team, Javad Castrati, Fiamma Melli, Jacopo Castelletti, Forrest Levet, and committee's deputy director, Julia Doubleday. Look alive out there. It's later than you think. It's the end of our broadcast day. Thanks for listening. This was the 10th program in our second series. 
For more global infotainment from the committee program click on the video screen right or screen left. Please like and subscribe to the committee program on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. Central European time.